Sorry about the delay. Okay, my name is Kenneth Gears. I work for NCIS and I've got a, a nice job in Estonia. So I've been there since the uh, since 2007, a couple of months after the, the infamous uh, cyber attacks. Uh, so in May this year, we, we held a cyber defense exercise. It particularly wanted to look at some uh, type cyber terrorist scenario and uh, particularly uh, with uh, critical information infrastructure, some SCADA elements. Uh, so uh, we're in Northern Europe, we're pretty far north, I'll show you in a second, but we, uh, in cooperation with the Swedish National Defense College and uh, an organization that's sort of the equiv Swedish equivalent of DARPA, uh, we, we, we put together a, uh, uh, an effort that took about, you know, some, for some people maybe up to a year uh, of work. But here's Sweden and Estonia, uh, there's Germany down there, uh, Mother Russia to the right, and Santa Claus just above us, kind of give you some uh, perspective. Estonia is about on uh, southern Alaska latitude in the Baltic Sea there in the middle. Here's a picture of Estonia uh, in the snow, uh, and we had lots of snow uh, last year, that was as much as about 100 years. Uh, so just two slides on the 2007 cyber attacks. So if you're not familiar with them, there was a, a Russian war, or a Soviet war memorial that they moved outside of the uh, uh, the center of town, and, it, and it, it upset the local Russians and Russia uh, exact, uh, as a country who view the World War II as, you know, it, in greater terms than just Soviet or, or uh, Stalinist uh, a legacy, they, they see it as real national achievement. So they were very upset about it and uh, there was a, a corresponding cyber attack which uh, wasn't the biggest or the most sophisticated cyber attack in history. However, uh, Estonia sort of uh, uh, occupies a special place, I think, in, in the history of cyberspace and cyber attacks just because it was one of those events when uh, you know, a, a major international crisis or uh, mid-level international crisis kind of spilled over into a cyber attack that was intended to hurt a country. Uh, and so, so anyway, it's a, it's a good case study, all for a bunch of reasons. We could talk about it later if you like, but Estonia is small, homogenous, very wired. They, they made this, the jump from sort of archaic Soviet technology to, uh, to an E-Estonia, that's their goal. So a couple of their achievements, the highest per capita online elections, um, you can pay taxes and et cetera with your phone and your pin calculator, 98% of banking is done online, uh, and Skype is Estonian originally, for instance. Uh, here is the Cyber Center of Excellence. If uh, We've had uh, some seminars, some training. We have a, a, a botnet mitigation course uh, right now and uh, um, a couple of conferences on, on uh, cyber conflict. Uh, so, one of the questions about cyber attacks is whether or not they're a threat to national security. And really, the, the, it, it's, a, it's, a, a, uh, it's a fascinating and worthwhile uh, discussion stream to follow uh, because you have re re people who say it's the end of the world and others really who, who think it's complete hype. Uh, and of course, it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, but. Uh, one of the things about the cyber defense exercise is we wanted to, uh, you know, make some progress on uh, um, uh, clarifying that situation. What we do know, though, is that, uh, you know, the, the web, I don't want to dwell on this, but is growing every day. And when you have electricity to elections sort of also riding on cyber now, you do have something at stake uh, to protect. So. Uh, National security thinking is uh, still to be determined, but if you saw a really great uh, um, keynote at Black Hat the other day by General Hayden, I, I think they're going to put it online by today. I, I encourage you to, to watch it because uh, the former CIA and NSA director is actually uh, was quite insightful on this, uh, on this very topic. Uh, let's see. CDXs are difficult uh, to stage, there's no doubt about it, and I think each one of them is unique. You really have to simulate everything, uh, and the problem with IT is it changes every day, of course, and so, so will your CDX. Um, the military, of course, is uh, the original founder of the Internet, and they use uh, computers for everything now to, to uh, even uh, stage complex uh, geopolitical uh, and uh, military scenarios. But the question is, of course, is, is how well you can model uh, the real world and, and uh, well, more on that later. So 
some of the structure of the cyber defense exercise, which you may or not be familiar with, uh, you have uh, friendly forces, hostile forces, uh, you have to have sort of a team dedicated to the infrastructure, uh, and at least a management team that, that sort of oversees everything and uh, determines, tries to determine its significance. Uh, the blue teams, these are the primary uh, um, targets for training, and usually they are you know, there are people like yourselves that do a system administration and, and computer security for a living, and their goal is to defend the CIA of the networks. Um, the red team, its goal is to undermine that CIA. And uh, within the virtual environment, the cool thing is, is not only is malicious code authorized, but it's highly encouraged. Um, there's so many things to talk about. I mean, one of the basic things is whether or not it's a white box or a black box test, and that, that goes to uh, really whether the, the, uh, the red team has prior knowledge of the networks or not. In our case, uh, we wanted to simulate some prior reconnaissance, so we gave them uh, three weeks uh, to look at the, uh, at the network topology. The white team is, uh, I was on the white team, I'm an analyst really, and so, but I've been doing cyber analysis uh, for, for a long time. Um, and so we're supposed to uh, kind of make everything uh, run on time, but also give it some, some punch. And, and of course in the end it's the white team that's going to talk to the, uh, the policy makers and those funding the exercise uh, and try to explain why, why it was important and, and worthwhile. Uh, the green team, though, makes everything happen, really. I mean, you can't stage a CDX with analysts, right? Uh, otherwise, you wind up with only hype. Uh, so it's the green team that actually connects all the wires together. And these guys were at the, uh, at the Swedish equivalent of DARPA in the middle of Sweden in a place called Linköping. The scenario is important uh, because, uh, you know, what, what do you want to say? What is your, your goal? And then how are you going to write the story afterwards? Uh, and and it, it, it's, it's key because, uh, you know, it goes to resources and cost and whether or not sort of the threat is sort of appropriate to the fear uh, and the, uh, the investments toward uh, mitigating that threat. Uh, because, you know, really one lone hacker is, is probably not going to uh, yeah, sort of allocate any congressional uh, money, that threat. But when you look at a foreign military or intelligence service, uh, it, it's quite different. Uh, and if your, your scenario uh, decides one way or another on this question, really, then uh, everything changes. So a little bit about cyber war, and these are my own thoughts, but you know, I, I think you know, uh, cyber attack by itself is, is really not very much, but it's you know, the real world effects, uh, and those can be as, as, as broad and as deep as the imagination of the attacker. So cyber espionage is, is uh, um, well, uh, governments are at it across the world because why? It's, it's, there's a really high return on investment uh, in cyber espionage. Um, and uh, I also think propaganda is really key to look at from the standpoint of, uh, you know, everyone at the Pentagon anyway is talking about narrative today. It's not whether you can go beat up your enemy on the field of battle only, it's whether or not you can you know, win the hearts and minds both of your own population and the population on, on the, on the uh, other side as well. Uh, so, you know, this was known for a long time. This is not new information. But if you go to the art of war, he says, look, you so you have fire and you're going to use fire to attack. Well, there's all kinds of things you can do with fire. Let me just give you some examples. So you can hit soldiers, their stores, baggage trains, etc. And finally, of course, you can just drop, uh, hurl dropping fire amongst the enemy. And of course, all of these, you could think of a direct or indirect analogy in cyberspace. So just a couple of screenshots uh, to, to prove to you that uh, cyber conflict is alive and well around the world. This is in, in 2000, there was uh, three Israeli soldiers that were kidnapped in Lebanon. And Israeli hackers, you know, th this really kicked off, I think, sort of a new period to a certain degree. They, they took out their frustration a little bit in cyberspace. And this is the Hezbollah, so the organization which w would have kidnapped the uh, soldiers in Lebanon, their website, and it was an attack against it. And, well, you know, you always throw around the word sophisticated, but this one really was to a certain degree because uh, the, the, uh, the site administrators really had a tough time um, 
uh, undoing it. And when they wanted to move their site to a, another place on the internet, they discovered that somebody had already bought up uh, various spellings and misspellings of Hezbollah before the attack. Um, so even within NATO, and I, the Cyber Center of Excellence basically supports uh, NATO, so roughly 30 countries, uh, Europe and North America, you know, you have conflict between Turkey and Greece. Um, you have uh, cyber conflict on behalf of ideas. In 2008, when Lithuania outlawed uh, Soviet symbols in the country, the first thing that hundreds and hundreds of sites throughout the country, including in the government, uh, were defaced with Soviet propaganda. Uh, within countries, you have, uh, you know, calls for freedom or, or anti-government uh, um, appeals. Uh, you have a guy here, Gary McKinnon, in, in, in the UK, uh, who literally is hacking on behalf of all of us, sort of the people of the world. He was convinced that the, the Pentagon knows about UFOs, and he was getting into the network to find proof of it. Here's a South American hacker group that is literally hacking on behalf of God. Uh, they have thousands of defacements around the world, and they always leave a religious message. So 2007, you had the Estonia case that was really the business case model of a cyber attack. In 2008, a year later, you have the military case model. And, um, and so really, it, it, it was important, and it's not like the Pentagon didn't know about this uh, prior. However, Georgia has this place in cyber history as well as clearly showing that any military conflict or operation in the future is going to have a cyber uh, dimension. Uh, there's no uh, two ways about it today. Uh, so this question of an electronic or digital Pearl Harbor is also kind of funny because we've also been debating that just like the uh, hype question for a long time. And while if you missed this one in 2007 in October, the Israeli Air Force destroyed the, uh, the Syrian uh, alleged nuclear reactor. Uh, and it's widely uh, alleged in the, the open press uh, that, uh, that a cyber attack played a, a, a critical role in taking down the Syrian air defense uh, before the planes crossed the border. Um, so this was just you know, last week uh, on Wired magazine, which is in general uh, sort of a skeptic on the whole cyber war thing, but just some information on how uh, you know, how widespread uh, the vulnerabilities of SCADA systems are. And I threw that in here because our CDX looks at that issue. Uh, so just some high-level thinking about cyber warfare. You know, I think the Internet is vulnerable. Cyber defenses are uh, relatively weak. I think that's one of the issues with cyber wars. It really kind of turns on its head the, the historical notion of defense has all the, uh, the uh, home field advantage, essentially, like in sports. Uh, it's, it's opposite in cyberspace because of the an anonymity issue, etc. Uh, so uh, non-state actors, you can't forget about them. But, but really, cyber attack, again, is, is uh, uh, it's sort of in the, uh, uh, it could be different every time, essentially. And so the question mark is key. So now to the, the CDX. And what, what is the CDX all about? I think what you really want to do, especially on the infrastructure side and on the white team side, before you sort of uh, lift the gates and let the horses run, is uh, you want, you want to, to develop something that's credible. Something that, you know, because these cost a lot of money and time, and so you want those who invested money in it and those who read the uh, after-action report uh, to feel like it was, it was worthwhile. Um, so, in particular, uh, that's going to be real-world impact, I think. And then I think a cyber attack truly can range from a, uh, a minor annoyance to probably a national security crisis. I mean, if you think about, for, for instance, the photos of the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, I mean, those did more damage to the political interests of the United States than all hacks combined, maybe, in history. And that was not a hack, even. It was. But what it, what it did was show the power of the web to take a, a, a picture or a, a well-written story, and it can be in everyone's living room today. Uh, and that's probably the most powerful cyber attack uh, that exists today. So uh, one of the things about uh, the nation state simulation uh, is uh, that military and government agencies, they're, they're, they're much, much more powerful than, than an individual and organization. And they're, not only are they going to have all their bases covered on, on IT, but then they're, they're going to be uh, 
uh, supported by experts in, in other disciplines. And this goes to the heart, for instance, of SCADA as well. I mean, you really would have to know something that is really pretty esoteric uh, insider type information if you're going to go after a factory. I mean, you can't expect uh, to manipulate uh, um, sort of SCADA controls without um, some, some knowledge of, uh, you know, that is, that is not widespread. Uh, here's just an example, but at Sandia National Laboratory, they have uh, a very famous red team that has lots of uh, uh, successful compromises. And, and I thought it worthwhile to put the, uh, the quote from a former chief there. Um, you know, our general Methodist asks, asks system owners, what's your worst nightmare? And then our goal is to make that happen. And of course, at Sandia Labs, of course, they would have the, the, um, the engineers uh, and the wherewithal to pull together this nation state style full scope attack that you just normally would not see uh, on the internet. And this is a kind of thing that, 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 that is a whole other level that is likely in these ongoing negotiations between US and Russia in particular today. You know, how do you manage these, these kind of things? Uh, so let's look a little bit at CDX history and how we got to today. Um, you know, cyber defenders, they may or not be warned. Uh, when these things uh, come their way. Uh, a good case in point was uh, eligible receiver in 1997, in which case the NSA played the role of North Korean hackers. Uh, and uh, an article about the event in foreign affairs was, was pretty good. Um, you know, but the thing is, is if you have a number of guys working on this and they've got a smart plan and they attack at various levels, you can imagine how much confusion they could create, especially if they owned all the email servers in question. Uh, because it would go to the question of prior reconnaissance, and you know that you know the general talks to the colonel, the colonel talks to the captain, talks to the private, etc., on down. And if you can insert yourself in there, uh, you know all of a sudden you know you could have these guys telling each other to go, everybody go play golf, take the day off that day. So uh, here's another example, just about how different these kinds of things are. But the EPA in 2006 was curious if the water supply could be poisoned. And so Sandia looked at that. And one of the first things they found was that there were just way too many facilities to look at. And so you had to come up with kind of a, 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 a programmatic uh, um, angle to take to pass out uh, the information to all relevant parties. Um, a current trend is international uh, CDXs. Uh, this this, um, uh, this is on the rise quickly, and this is one of the specific things we really want to do in, in Estonia. Not surprisingly, at the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, the whole point is to get uh, international institutions on the same page. And I was real lucky to be the first one assigned uh, from internationally to the Cyber Center of Excellence in uh, 2007, and now uh, we're at nine countries. I just read in the news last week we got Hungary on board, so that's uh, that's uh, nine countries, including the uh, Italy, Spain, Germany, and a bunch of uh, other countries as well. Uh, so I think within 10 years, in the, from the NATO angle, all 30 or so, I think there's 28 now, uh, countries will be part of the center. And so it'd be, it could be quite a hub for, I think, uh, a cyber defense in the future. Uh, however, so you can see them growing in sophistication. 2006, we looked at hacktivists. In 2008, uh, it was about a nation state actor. And then already in 2009, you see a CDX's stage in places like uh, T Tajikistan, which I'm sure uh, was new for them. So Baltic Cyber Shield, that's, uh, that's the name of our exercise. Uh, we had uh, seven uh, countries, uh, six national blue teams, and we had a 20-person international uh, red team. And for what it's worth, uh, the, the red team was we had to buy them you know, some hotel rooms and I think beer and cake and stuff. But uh, we had one proposal that came from a large contractor to supply the red team, just to give some perspective. Uh, and the price was $500,000 to provide a red team. Uh, and so uh, uh, we got by on far, far less uh, than that, and, and they were quite good, actually. And it, it goes to, I think, another area, uh, and I think DEF CON is the perfect place to talk about this, but, you know, it's, a, it's an area in which you need passion. You need passion more than you need money, really. And, and, and DEF CON really is all about that, because you can see you know, people come here uh, because they want to be here. So the Baltic Cyber Shield uh, is a live fire CDX. It's really cool, because I've been to some in the past, some DOD things, frankly, uh, that were all, you know, these guys sitting around a table, and, and somebody passes you a note. And that note says, you are under massive cyber attack. What do you do? You know, and of course, it's a Navy SEAL or something. He says, OK, well, you know, who do I kill? 
And the, the neat thing about Baltic Cyber Shield is, is that it was none of that really. It was just all let's build the infrastructure uh, and let's let uh, the red team attack the blue teams and see what the blue teams do. Uh, and so that's really cool. Uh, so here are some of the inspirations for it, and there was a small event in 2008 uh, in which, uh, but it was much, much smaller. There's really some students from Sweden, some students from Estonia got together over, over a weekend, and, and sauna and beer. Sauna is a big deal in Estonia if, you, if you're not uh, uh, familiar with the, the fin Finland and uh, uh, Estonian culture. And so uh, a lot of our meetings, they go into the evening, and we have uh, dinner, and then literally everybody is, is naked. And it's uh, uh, it's uh, one of the things about it is is uh, it, we call it meeting room three, but it, it is uh, a place where you know you you don't bring any hardware or software or or clothing, and so it's I guess in the end it facilitates a conversation, especially after all the uh, vodka that's provided. Uh, so the scenario, uh, so I'm on the white team, so scenario is important to me, but we wanted to explore the, the uh, question of cyber uh, terrorism. Uh, in particular, we wanted to look at this uh, SCADA issue. So the blue teams uh, were going to be kind of a higher gun rapid reaction team that shows up when uh, there was a, a sort of a, a computer security audit and failure at a company. There was volatile geopolitical tensions. Uh, there was a, a threat uh, against these uh, companies that had uh, dirty energy. And there was even a fear that there were some insiders on the network. So the company had decided to wholesale get rid of their uh, staff and bring in this team. Uh, the blue team is definitely, we decided, is, is the goal uh, for this year, you know, to, to, uh, to teach and to train. Uh, but two other, uh, two other goals as well. One, we really wanted as much international participation as possible, which if you're interested in next year's event, you can get in touch with me. It's fairly easy through ccdcoe.org or the Cyber Defense Center of Excellence website. Uh, but we'll start that almost immediately for next year. Uh, and Estonia is a lovely place to visit in June. Uh, and then finally, we wanted to say how many things that we could we come up with uh, for future CDXs, not only for our center, but for the world, really, uh, and in terms of lessons learned and, and, uh, and how to do it better uh, in the future. Uh, so on the white team, we had to come up with scoring criteria. And so this is always a lot of interest because, as you'll see in the captured flag uh, um, room here, you know, the scoring board is what everybody's really interested in, who's winning and who's losing. Uh, so the, the positive points for blue team, uh, these are thwarted attacks and innovative strategies and tactics, but a, a crucial element, if you're not familiar with it, are these business requests. So not only are you under massive cyber attack, but somebody hands you a note which says you need to, uh, you know, the, the CEO of your company is in another country and he needs immediately or she needs immediate access to a sort of internal, uh, you know, file server because they need to give a presentation, right? So these are business requests that not only do you have to fend off the attacks, but you have to sort of keep your company running at the same time. Uh, and so the negative points, that's pretty clear. We'll, we'll talk about how to lose points. Here's the green team, they're based in, uh, in Sweden. Um, so uh, one of the key things is these uh, miniature factories. So we had this steel table, and I'll show you a picture of it. We had these small factories on the table uh, that represented sort of the, the, the grand prizes in Baltic Cyber Shield 2010. Uh, and we actually uh, put this butane flame on the back that if the hackers could figure out, they could blow up the factory. The blue teams, uh, they all had identical uh, infrastructure. They weren't allowed to log in to their network until the, uh, the day of, and that simulated the rapid reaction team uh, style approach uh, that we had. Um, uh, the, the network was fairly insecure, uh, and as you can see, there are four VLAN segments. I'll show you those. Uh, here's some of the, the, the specs on the, the game environment. Uh, so you can see that, but if you're interested, you can check that out later or ask me about it. Here's the, here's the network, so there was internal uh, DMZ, HMI, and PLC, which connect the program uh, logic controller that, that was uh, connected to the remote factory. Uh, our SCADA, here are some of the specs on that. Um, there's a human machine interface, which was Simplicity Software. Uh, GE PLCs. Here are the factories. Uh, so there were two each uh, per blue team. And uh, when I visited Sweden before the exercise, 
Um, and it was, this is such a big event, so I'll just tell you, you know, the bits and pieces that I was able to, to learn, but, you know, there was a group of us there, you know, trying to, to, to uh, query the, the green team on, on everything they did, and somebody kind of mentioned, well, these are, these are toys, or these are models or something, and he said, these are absolutely not. He said, from our perspective, we tried to design this scenario as accurately as possible, and, and this hardware and software is in use today for SCADA systems. Uh, so here's a model steam engine that was also there. Uh, I understand that they had a little solar plant. I wasn't able to see that. Uh, that was also connected uh, to the to the system. Uh, here's the GE PLC. Uh, the blue teams, when they logged onto the network, they were certainly allowed uh, to harden the network. They had a you know a minimum uh, number of applications and services, of course, that they had to uh, to provide on the network and. And just FYI, this is really difficult, and I'll get to this uh, shortly, but the, the white team really needs to have enough people so that they can um, see and understand everything that's going on in the CDX, because it's not easy, really. All the things that the red team is doing, all the things that the blue team is doing, the white team, which tends to be comprised of people like me or analysts or, you know, kind of government people, they're, they're just not tech enough to understand everything that's happening. Uh, and so uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but they're definitely allowed to install and modify existing software once they, uh, once they log in. Uh, so the red team, we had uh, 20 people on the team, and they're angry environmentalists, uh, and they, they're going to, to uh, try to shut down these power companies and force them into greener energy. Uh, so internally there were four sub-teams, uh, you can see those. Uh, we allowed them uh, three weeks uh, for prior uh, reconnaissance and a place. Uh, and to do some hacking uh, and leave a couple of back doors to simulate uh, some insider activity beforehand. Uh, there was good visualization for the white team in, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, exercise. So you could see the topography, you could see the chat channels, uh, and a cool terrestrial map of the world. There was a lot of work that went into this uh, uh, effort. and so. While we were all in Northern uh, Europe, we actually used uh, the Southern Hemisphere for the game. And we had you know, two of the blue teams were in South America, two in Africa, and two in Southeast Asia. And then the red team was in Iceland. Uh, here's part of the, uh, uh, the uh, visualization that we had. Um, here's, a, here's a closer look so you can see the, the connectivity that, it, that exists uh, between the, uh, uh, the, the attackers and the defenders. Uh, and also the, the endpoints, the, the factories. Uh, here is uh, the Cyber Center of Excellence. If you come for a visit, you're all uh, invited and, and welcome. We have a number of big events a year now. Uh, we just uh, had a conference a couple weeks ago, and we had uh, Bruce Schneier and Melissa Hathaway and a bunch of others who were, if Charlie Miller is here, he gave the talk of the, uh, of the uh, conference, uh, which was Kim Jong-il and me. Uh, so I highly encourage you to see that here. It's Charlie Miller's advice to uh, North Korea on how to build a uh, cyber attack army to take down the U.S. Uh, but we have a great uh, uh, infrastructure uh, in Estonia to work, to work with. Uh, the, R the Red Team campaign was divided into these four phases, and I'll go through those individually. Uh, initially, there was a declaration of war. So the first goal was to deface the public website of the, of the blue teams uh, and to threaten them with, uh, with action if they didn't take uh, some, some, uh, some greener uh, strategies toward energy provision. So in phase one, uh, the white team was allowed to compromise. They had some limits uh, the white team placed. And still, things moved so quickly that the, the, uh, the white team has trouble staying on top of everything. But the, but the red team largely accomplished these goals, which was in the first, so there was two days, essentially morning, afternoon, morning, afternoon. First morning was compromise one server in the DMZ and one in, in the internal. And it, was, uh, and it was still quite a hectic morning uh, because the blue teams came in to a fairly insecure network and are scrambling to understand the network and to, uh, uh, to find back doors and to, to prevent attacks. Phase two, the, the, the first afternoon, uh, so the red team was able to get over 40 uh, compromises. Um, and uh, uh, one uh, MySQL SCADA uh, report server. Um, one of the things we w wondered was, 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 was it, would it make it too easy for the red team? Uh, but it's really hard to know, and all of this we're still discussing uh, with the teams involved. I mean, it, it's like any class you go to. You know, if you go to a hacking class, there'll be, you know, a couple of people who, who they've already finished the exercise before it's even begun, a couple of people who can't even turn on their computer, 
and then uh, you know a wide range in the middle uh, and so so it's hard to know exactly where to where to teach but we clearly also had that as well there was one team one blue team that by far was the winner and I'll show you what they did in a second uh, you know but some that had just about zero points and and I went to this at Black Hat the other day they had a uh, this national collegiate cyber defense competition uh, panel uh, and I asked I was talking to the red team guys afterwards and I said what really annoys you about uh, you know what some of the blue team guys what, what they do and he said the worst thing by far is that they just adopt unrealistic strategies uh, and tactics and they just tend to unplug everything from the network uh, you know at the start of the exercise and then they start slowly rebuilding we also had one of those in ours, you know, uh, essentially they did exactly that. Uh, so phase three, uh, the third morning, uh, or the second day for, uh, in the morning, uh, essentially the goal was to, to, uh, to find these HMI terminals uh, and see if the, the uh, red team could get a hold of the, uh, the SCADA infrastructure. In the end, only one of the 12 model factories was set on fire, and it was, uh, went off at the 1300 Zulu, uh, on the second day, uh, and you can see uh, what, 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 how it was set, and you can imagine if all f 12 of those had been going off at once, I'm not sure uh, that the, the fire alarm, s alarm system would have uh, held. Um, okay, so uh, one of the differences, though, between just, you know, bringing in a red team and what a military or an intelligence agency might do to you uh, is the fact that our, our red team just really didn't understand how the factory processes worked. Uh, a Sandia red team, if they were, if their goal were to take on, you know, your company, um, you know, they would have the, the necessary support personnel to probably figure out how to do you in and blow up your factory, uh, theoretically, um, that our red team just didn't seem to have. And so, so it, was, it was an issue that, that, you know, maybe more red team, green team communications or training could have helped, but it's always hard with these CDXs because all these people you're bringing in for the two-day uh, exercise, they've got, they're really busy people otherwise. Uh, so the phase four, this turned out to be not such a great idea, uh, but we allowed the red team to sort of essentially to start destroying everything. Uh, and what they did was sort of destroy their own ability to, uh, you know, to, um, uh, to win the game, essentially, because the white team had no idea what was going on. And this was really demoralizing for the blue team, for instance, as well, uh, because there was so much chaos and destruction. And so one of the recommendations, well, I'll show you in a second, is, is do not have this kind of phase. You really need, you know, throughout the CDX to have, um, this could be on, you know, day five when it's over, perhaps. But, uh, you know, everything you do, there's so much time and money and effort that goes into it, really needs to have a clear um, uh, point and a goal. So here are some of the vulnerabilities that were exploited uh, by, the, uh, by the red team. In the end, they had uh, 80 computers. Um, here's some more stuff that they did. Uh, one, of the, one of the significant things is that they had a zero day that was really good for just about any browser in existence today. Uh, the problem was, uh, was that the... Uh, you really need for a cyber defense exercise dumb users and this is another category of people that we thought that the white team could just fill in essentially quickly and it was absolutely not possible because one they weren't tech enough uh, and two they're too busy doing other things and so one of the recommendations which you'll see is to have a much uh, more uh, robust uh, white team and some technical people there uh, but also unfortunately you, you need to allocate some people who are really just dumb users because they otherwise you don't have any really client-side exploits, right, and client-side attacks that the red, the red team was kind of stuck, you know, hacking itself without relying on any of the dumb users internally to help them achieve their goals. So Blue Team 5 was an easy winner in the game. Uh, they were able to, uh, to take all their essential services uh, and move them to a higher security virtual uh, machine. They used out-of-band communications from the beginning, IPsec filtering, um, and after the first part of the game, I think the, the word was, was that the red team, uh, apart from some denial of service activity, was able to gain really no points against them. And I talked to the guy the other day on the phone. He said that they really, they felt like they were, they, they were able to find the malware very quickly in the back doors uh, and shut them off. Uh, here are some of the things uh, that the blue teams did uh, successfully, you know, with, within uh, Linux and Windows uh, and uh, just on, on the network. Um, but App Armor, I understand, was really uh, helpful. 
um, the uh, the SE46 uh, computer integrity system. They also spent the winning team uh, uh, employed that. Um, so were the goals met for the exercise? Uh, well, uh, we hope so, but I think to a certain degree, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was just have the exercise work so that everybody felt that they were uh, gainfully employed, uh, and it appeared that, that that happened. There was very little downtime reported. Uh, we were able to at least look at the cyber terrorist SCADA uh, scenario. We had a lot of people. It was, it was over 100 people from seven countries, um, and uh, so some of the lessons uh, more white team manpower and you have to have at least one white team member uh, per blue team and two for the red team there's a lot of mistrust there uh, frankly what the red team says we've done X that you'll get the blue team saying they absolutely did not do that and vice versa uh, so and you know part of the thing about cyber attack and cyber defense is is that there is a lot of uncertainty frankly um, am I under attack and or am I not and and uh, so uh, enough said on that. Uh, it's very important to have a one full day, we think, after this exercise that's only on mechanics, that is on uh, connectivity, bandwidth, rules, scoring. Uh, you cannot have any questions once the bell sounds uh, and the game starts uh, about, about, about scoring rules uh, and, and well, you know, I can't log in, my passwords don't work, or you know, I'm trying to do X, Y, but the bandwidth is not there. All of that, you need to spend a full day uh, on that, uh, uh, those efforts. You need dumb users, and so don't forget that. that these, are, these are like your interns or something to bring them in. And we, had, we truly had a, a wasted O day. From the standpoint of the red team, that was going to be their, uh, their way to, uh, to get into the network uh, on the HMI side. Um, VMware server console was a failure, really. It was, it, was, it was too big and slow, and it didn't work with certain types of software, and so that we need to come up with another solution. They're already working on that for next year, and you might be interested in that. For instance, you can contact us. Um, the blue teams, they really need some administrative rights. They can't always ask the change control board or you know, the white team or the green team, can we do X, Y, or Z? There's just no time for it. So to a certain extent, you really need to give your blue teams uh, the, the ability to download and install software. And perhaps uh, think about that prior and have a, maybe a, a better server than we did with, uh, with patches and software on it that they may need. Um, in any project this big, you can imagine there were seven different uh, um, clashing agendas. And so, so that's really critical to have a, a large white team with really sort of maybe even military style authoritative, you got to do this and you have to do it by Monday uh, sort of thing because everybody's so busy. Uh, you can imagine up to a CDX and once it starts, a lot of people really haven't had time to, to think about it. Um, so, uh, final thought for me is that some, so some of the challenges inherent in a CDX are the same challenges that you're going to have in the real world. I mean, you're, almost, you're not going to have any two CDXs that are the same, uh, and that's probably a good thing, because there might not be two uh, cyber attacks that are ever quite the same. We don't know what's going to happen two weeks from now or two years from now. We have no idea. Um, the intangible nature of cyberspace, you know, very subjective. And we had one at our conference recently, uh, this Martin Lubicki of the Land Rand Corporation, he spoke about this, this uh, idea he's working with, Sub Rosa Cyber War, which I thought was quite interesting, in how you can imagine a, a fairly healthy cyber war take place between new t two nation states, and uh, nobody knows about it. Why does nobody know about it? Because there is no incentive for either side to discuss it, right? Because uh, because uh, the, the legal issues, the political issues, you might want to hack back, you might, you don't know, maybe you don't know quite what they've got, you don't want to let them know, you want to try and do what they did to you, etc. There's just too many unknowns in cyberspace, too many intangibles, such that uh, um, you could imagine a, even a fairly healthy cyber war going entirely unreported. Now, I know the, there's a new thing in Estonia. There's a lot, like, for instance, I mentioned this uh, online elections, uh, online taxes, Skype. There's a number of the, the, if the Estonia Cyber War of 2007. And the, the uh, uh, so there's a number of firsts, and there's a new first in Estonia. There's something called the Estonian Cyber Defense League now, which they're only just unveiling. Um, and I think it stems from 2007, but it's also something that you might want to, to look out for, uh, and they were discussing it. There was a general over at the um, uh, Black Hat this week discussing the same thing about how is 
you know, he works at the Office of Secretary of Defense, and how he, can he get into the society in America and figure out, uh, you know, who's under attack? And there's so much intellectual property, for instance, there's university work and all of this stuff. Uh, and so, to, from a certain standpoint, these are all non-military targets, right? You're talking about the University of X, University of Y, or this company uh, that are probably the primary targets, perhaps, for cyber defense and cyber attack. And, you know, the stock exchange, for this is not a military target. It's not even a valid, perhaps, you know, um, a military target during wartime. However, uh, you, can, you can imagine that these are healthy targets. Anyway, enough on that. So I asked him for all this documentation. I said, can you tell me some more about the Cyber Defense League? Uh, and he sent me a bunch of documentation. Uh, but they're just unveiling it now. And it's kind of a national guard for cybersecurity in Estonia. And so this is going to be interesting to watch. One of the reasons that people like Estonia on this cyber issue is that it's a great sort of incubator or test bed for all these things. And again, I think this is a really a new first for Estonia, maybe. And I heard from somebody, I have no idea if this is accurate, but they might be looking to expand this to about 10,000 people, uh, which, is, which is a lot, especially in a country as small as Estonia. That would be like a million people in our country or something. Uh, but anyway, so these are the two pictures that he sent me of personnel in the Cyber Defense League. He actually sent me these yesterday, and I, I don't know if this is intended to be kind of a, a, a joke or not, but he's probably saying these are some of the people that are his targets for to be a personnel in the Cyber Defense League, which they, they don't look like cyber defenders, they look like dancers. So references. Uh, I'm going to be on the panel here next, so unfortunately I don't have Q&A across the way, but I'll be around in, in, uh, um, for the next couple of days, and I'm willing, I think we have a few more minutes left, uh, you can ask me questions now if you like. Thanks.